Let's begin with a very short, brief little demo. So, who has not seen that before? Who, has, who is not aware of that problem? Ah, quite a few. Who is a little bit worried that that's actually a thing? Who didn't spot what the point of that video was? <laughs> okay. Okay, so what you saw there was a fully deterministic random number generator running on an Arduino. So, the Arduino has a very limited space. It's an 8-bit microcontroller. It's the ATmega 328P chip, for those of you who are interested. And that is actually the constraint that they're trying to satisfy. So this is what's going on. This is why it's bad. What you have is a thing called a linear congruential generator, an LCG. Okay? That's the five lines of code, top left. What that is doing is it's just generating numbers OK, again and again and again, feeding back into itself. And they look kind of random. The problem is it's fully deterministic whatever the seed is chosen. The seed that's chosen by default, one. OK. So every Arduino will generate the same random numbers in the same sequence. If you change the seed, you're not actually changing the random numbers. You're just shifting it around this whole thing. Now, on an AVR, uh, the AVR microcontrollers, the AVRs, the architecture. It takes about two days to do a full cycle. Okay, two days. On my laptop, it takes 26 seconds. That gives you the kind of power disparity that we're dealing with when we're trying to implement code on a microcontroller versus implementing code on, say, a laptop or a server or some other production environment. Now, people have said, why am I picking on Arduino? I'm not, honestly. It's just that Arduino, uh, well, it's the cheapest that I can find. It's the most readily available. And also, it's got a huge ecosystem with a kind of an IDE that's really easy to use. They give them out in schools, for example. So lots of people will use an Arduino because of that accessibility. Now, I am not expecting Arduinos to be perfect. People have said, well, what did you expect? It's a $2 chip. What do you expect? Well, to be honest, I could have been expecting that. But the bigger problem is that there's nothing in the documentation anywhere that says, this is a thing. It just says, you can get random numbers. And no one gives a second thought as to what that actually means. So what I'm going to do today is take you through what a random number is mathematically. I make every apology for my lack of apologies about the mathematics. <laughs> that makes sense. Think about it. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about mathematics now. So the LCG has this lovely um, property. Uh, in the late 60s, a paper was published by a gentleman called Marsaglia. Uh, he published a paper called Random Numbers for Mainly in the Plains. That's a joke, by the way. Okay, that's that's a funny. You should tell tell yourselves. Um, so the idea was is that he did some analysis and he found that the random numbers generated by an LCG, that code over there, although you can change the parameters, that particular bit of code spits out numbers that fall naturally in a plane or hyperplane, as it should be called, that cuts through some n-dimensional cube. What that means is you can actually slice up this cube and go, the random numbers are always going to be here. All right? And we've known this since the 60s. We've known this technically since before TCP IP was a thing, if you were at Miko's talk earlier. So 
Let's take a little bit of a step back and let's think about what random numbers really are. Okay? We use them in cryptography. I'll come to that in the next slide. But we also use them in other areas of life. We use them in gaming and gambling. Okay? If you have a random number of dice throw, a roulette spin, a deck shuffle, you expect it to be random. Okay? You don't expect to be able to guess the next sequence of cards, because otherwise you'd be able to game the system. Even digital systems have quite strict requirements, a 4% win over 100 million spins as a requirement. Okay? And they have to be able to justify that their games will fit in to the random numbers such that this is going to be true. All right? Likewise, we use it in science a lot. Okay? Statistical sampling, for example, relies on random numbers. Okay? Likewise, control group selection. If you are selecting a control group for a trial, you shouldn't be able to predict who is or is not going to be in the control group versus the test group. We also use it in things like Monte Carlo simulations. If you run the Monte Carlo simulation twice on an Arduino, you'll get the same output. And if that's what you think is science, it's probably not a very good thing. So we need random numbers to do Monte Carlo simulations and other statistical simulations in order to be effective. We also use it in astronomy and things like where you have a very large data set, a lot of which will look very random. So what you do is you generate something that really is random, and then you do a comparison. Okay? And that's how you find patterns. That's how you find things out. Even in history um, and art, we've used random numbers for a long time. In ancient times, back in ancient Greece, for example, um, or ancient cultures tend to have, whoop, tend to have thing, this kind of thing. What they have is the idea that randomness is in some way not humanly uh, configurable. You can't control it if you're a human. So by casting dice or casting sticks, you're in some way communicating with the gods or whatever you're particularly into. Likewise, the ancient Greeks, um, their democracy was actually a sortition. There's a device called the clerotelion, and that would take uh, colored dice in a tube or a series of tubes. They'd be dropped into a tray. The color would tell you the office, and then the numbers would tell you the person that's going to occupy that office. And that's how they did democracy. Likewise, in art, Dadaism and uh, uh, Jackson Pollock paintings, you know, there's a, a real sort of move towards this kind of randomness and this kind of feel that we have. So this is where they fit into society. But of course, we don't really care about that kind of stuff. What we care about is cryptography. Random numbers are really important in cryptography. When I teach at the university, uh, local to me university, uh, Beckett University in Leeds, I uh, tend to tell them that there are five kind of pillars of, ran of uh, cryptography. And one of them is random number generation. Other ones would be things like cipher suites, and then cipher modes is another. Uh, key management is a big one, and trapdoor or one-way functions for hashing and that kind of thing. But random numbers I emphasize, they're really important. Don't mess them up, okay? So here's how we use them. We use them in key generation. You should never be able to guess my key. Okay? If you can guess my key, I can't keep a secret the way I want to. Likewise, uh, IV or N once, I say N once because nonce has a meaning in this country. Um, just saying. Uh, so I, in N once generation, you shouldn't ever be able to predict the IV. Like if you were to have, oh, I don't know, a hardware Ethereum wallet which had a static IV, that might be considered a bad thing. If anyone's seen the news last week, that is a thing, by the way. If you're generating random salts, you don't want the salts themselves to be predictable, so we use random numbers there. Cookies and session tokens, if I can predict by, say, taking the time of day or the epoch time and some user artifacts, and I can then predict your session uh, token or your cookie or whatever, then I can do account takeover and I can really mess with stuff. So if you're generating random numbers, they shouldn't be guessable for your tokens. One-time pads, theoretically perfect security, relies very heavily on random numbers. So how do we get them? Well, some common methods are on the right here. Uh, we say, right, true random number generation. These are the things you find in things like TPMs and HSMs, okay, little chips or cores in chips that do a lot of cryptography for you, or they do a lot of uh, 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 random number generation and other things for you. So you include the silicon and then you can just talk to it. Um, they generate uh, random numbers 
in a true sense, they take an actual source of randomness. But that's actually very slow compared to how a laptop might do it. So for that, we have pseudo-random number generators. We've got quite a few, actually. The old ones of history, or at least they should be in my view, are the LCGs in the LFSRs, the Linear Feedback Shift Registers. These are also referred to as deterministic RNGs, DRNGs. That is, they'll always be the same. But we also have another kind of subspecies of these PRNGs called the cryptographically secure PRNGs. And these are ones where we go, okay, they have enough of an internal state to warrant being called cryptographically secure so that no one could ever kind of catch up with that. So I mentioned IoT. I mentioned this thing in the title. Why? Well, here's one example. Here we have a kind of an overview of, of the LoRa WAN stack using uh, Things Network as your cloud service. Notice that you have here a net session key and an application session key. What these do is these encrypt traffic from the devices, yes, the devices, all the way to the network server, and then that will pass on the data encrypted with the app session key to your cloud service. Here, you may think, well, What's wrong? Well, the app session keys are not stored. They're generated on the fly in a process called over-the-air activation. So a device end once and an application end once are generated and swapped in the clear. And they are then used to generate these keys. So if I can predict the next random number, I remove roughly 16 bits of entropy from that process. OK? It also relies on a thing called the app key. The app key is interesting because uh, Things Network only require that the app key be either default, as in every device has it, or they are per device. There's no requirement for them to be per device. It's just, if you feel like it, the answer is you probably should do that. So if I get your app key and I can predict your random numbers, that might be a real problem. There is a UK flood network where their prototypes were built on 80 mega 328Ps, the chip I showed you in the demo. They've now moved on. They use STM32 F4 and 1s in some of them. Now they move, uh, move to uh, numerous uh, sensors. But this could have been quite problematic. Okay? This could have had some ramifications. Now, others might say, well, you have AES128 in ECB mode. That's the bad one. Um, Run, uh, as a requirement, you have key exchange or artifact exchange in the clear, and there's no support in LoRaWAN for exchanging the app keys, okay? You have to do it through firmware update or some other mechanism, assuming you've implemented it, which of course you had, because you're good devs. So this could have been problematic. Other examples. Uh, top left, you will see an excerpt from the Spritz implementation for Arduino. This is still in use, by the way. Their bestpractice.ino file has this as the entropy pool. The first 64 characters of pi. Hmm. Now, for those of you who know a little bit of ASCII magic, you're probably realizing, ah, that means that half of the entropy pool is 0011 guaranteed, no hows barred, okay? That is a problem. I submitted a fix which was absolutely bare minimum because I didn't want to start messing with other people's code too much. Um, and I got told, no, we're not going to push that. We're going to put a warning instead. That'll do it, right? It's not a thing. Arduino LoRa. Now, you'll, you'll see a lot of LoRa in this... Um, in these slides, I'm, it's a thing that I look at quite a bit um, because I kind of like the idea. Uh, for those of you who don't know, LORA, LoRa, is a very long range, ultra low power uh, radio frequency communication protocol. So with only a few, uh, uh, off a normal sign of uh, battery, you can get a range of up to five kilometers very easily. Yes, it, work, it propagates that well through air. So. I looked at their implementation, and I found this lovely little function. Look at that, LoRa class, random. It just returns the RSSI, for those of you who don't know. That's the received, uh, received signal strength indicator. It's just how loud is it. The problem is IoT devices don't move. The RSSI is going to be static. What are you doing? That's not random, OK? You can make it random, and I'll show you how. But that isn't random. 
All right? So I mentioned at the start there's going to be some mathematics. To make it a little bit easier, I have a little visual cue that will tell you when the maths is running. OK? So when this changes, you're safe. OK? Because being a mathematician, I get one of three responses. Um, the first one is kind of like, oh, you must be so clever. Nah, I'm really sorry, I'm not. <laughs> you know, when I make a cup of tea and I haven't had enough coffee, then, you know, sort of it's, uh, I put the teaspoon in the bin and the tea bag in the sink and I put the milk on my head. It's just not good, it's not good. Or I get the other reaction of kind of, oh, I was terrible at maths at school. And the self-deprecation just keeps flowing. Or the last one, and this is actually quite common, is I hated maths at school. And it's like, well, there's the outpour of PTSD from Mrs. Smith, your maths teacher. I'm really sorry for what you did, but like, if you saw maths the way I did, you know, you'd love it. Hopefully, you'll love a little bit of this as well. So I'm going to use some slightly unusual notation and definitions, nothing too much. I'm only going to define things, no theorems, no proofs, nothing what you would call hard or difficult. So first of all, I'm going to use Greek letters. That's what that is, that little weird-looking O is a sigma. Um, just in case you didn't know, that sigma is what I'm going to use to represent strings. Now, the straight lines either side, they are actually taken from uh, linear algebra. So vectors have a magnitude, a length, literally. So this is the string length. The next one is log base 2 of y. We use that a lot, OK, because of this. It answers the question, what is the number, the number x, such that 2 to the power of x equals y? OK? And when we do that, well, we actually get the number of bits needed to write the number y. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, OK, cool. Um, 2 to the omega is shorthand for the set of 0 and 1 to the power n. That is infinitely many from that set. That is a thing called the infinite binary string space, also called the Cantor space after some dead German guy. So we also use this notation here, 2 to the less than omega. That just means finite strings. Arbitrary length, OK, arbitrary length. Uh, so it could be longer than the visible universe, but it is only, it is still finite in some sense. So this is what I want to sort of show you. We're going to build up to a proper mathematical definition of randomness, all right? And we're going to build up there uh, quite, quite steadily. Uh, this won't take too long, don't worry, this battery is finite, so I have to, you know, keep up. Take this little game on the left, okay? The blocks can move up and down. They can't go left and right. They only move up and down. The blocks moving up and down give you lots of possible situations that they can shift into. How many situations are there? How can I describe this accurately? Well, I have 12 bits. I have nine ones and three zeros. So surely it's 12 bits. The answer is no. Here's why. I can take the blank space at the top or in the first position or in the uh, second to bottom position or in the last position. So that's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2 bits. 2 bits per column doth 6 bits make. So if I have 12 bits in this sense, I actually only have 6 free bits of entropy, effectively. Entropy here being the entire state space, and then normally you apply some probability distribution, that is, there are some states that are more likely and some that are less likely. So it's common when you speak to people, entropy, that's disorder, right? Mm, not really. I refer you to the work of Lydia Glotzer in Chicago, I think it's Chicago University, and she's working on systems where the entropy tends towards order, and she's growing what look a lot like crystals in simulations by manipulating the, energy, uh, the entropy, not the energy, of a system. So this is quite important. We actually have a name for this in information theory. That's what this little equation is here. It's called Shannon entropy, and it's just probabilities multiplied by the number of bits needed to express it. OK? And then you sum all that up, and you get some sort of measure which you can use. All right? We're going to play a little game. OK? Does anyone really not like bananas? Right, do you want one? If I throw a banana, is someone going to catch it? Yeah? OK, one over there. Lovely. Can you stand up for me? And one over there. 
Okay, I just pick up the banana and stand up. I have pop-up bananas if you'd like. Yeah, stand just, just, and then things are gonna happen. What I wanna show you is, this is a room full of 400 chairs, okay? And I've randomly chosen two people, well, random-ish, you know, I did ask first. Um, but I've randomly chosen two people out of this distribution of people to stand up, and those are gonna be my, uh, my one bits. And the rest of you are all zeros. All the other seats are zeros. You can sit down, thank you. But what if I have n many people, okay? We're now playing random games. Can we enumerate some sort of information about this random game? And the answer is yes, okay? What are we doing? I'm taking some n, the number of empty buckets, and I'm choosing two of them. And we use this. This is called the binomial coefficient. And I can define very rigidly what, how many possible games there are for a given n of the game of two banana throwing. Okay? And the answer is n squared minus n over 2, which is expressible here as I need this many bits to express this number, and then I can address every single game in the space. Okay? So although it looks very random, it's actually got a very small complexity compared to the overall space of n. There are other things I can do. I could measure, for example, the whole length. And I could say two coordinates, the white space on the left and then the white space between the two bananas. And then I can say, well, what's the uh, biggest number I can have? It's when one's in the middle and the other one's at the other end. Because then as this one moves this way, this number gets bigger, but this number, like for like, gets smaller, give or take. Okay, so actually I only need the uh, two log two, log base two of n over two, which is basically twice times the number of bits to, to describe half the space. Notice how a random game that had very little meaning, and may or may not be a contrived example, um, has given us some sort of information about the randomness which we can then move forward with. And what I want to get to is this. This is called the of complexity. So, we're going to deal with universal Turing machines. Who's heard of those before? Anyone? Oh, cool. Brilliant. So the Kolmogorov complexity formally is you say, what is the shortest input to that such that the machine will run and it will halt and it will output the string I want? OK? That is the question you're asking. It actually makes sense to say, what is the Python Kolmogorov complexity? You'll notice it goes from C to K. That's because there's a thing called prefix-free Kolmogorov complexity, and that's actually minimal across all information uh, content measures. Uh, that's a proof due to Chaitin. Um, but I, uh, the, the reason you would want to have prefix-free sets, OK, prefix-free set is the set of phone numbers. What? They've got prefixes? Mm, not quite what it means. You can't take two phone numbers, put them together, and get another one as in no phone number is a prefix of another, so the set of phone numbers is prefix-free. That's all that means. Easy, easy, easy. So let's ask ourselves some questions then. These are three strings. Okay, how do they end? 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, exactly. 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, 01, exactly. Okay, easy. How about this one? 1-0-0-1-0-1-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-
is asking the opposite question. Okay? But if it can, I claim that the string is long enough that whenever you uh, process it, the only way to generate that string is just to print it out. So intuitively, we can't do better than producing the string with a print function of some kind. All right? So complete incompressibility leads to this. This is a mathematical definition of randomness, OK? A string is one random. Um, the one refers to uh, the Turing jump of it. So two random is above the double jump, or sorry, below the double jump, and then three randoms below the triple jump and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's one random if I can take any initial segment, and that doesn't give me a clue as to the next bit. It's always going to be C incompressible, OK? The whole infinite string, there is a finite number C that minimizes that below its complexity, OK? And that string can effectively be zero, if, it, if you want. This is where we're going, OK? This is actually used. The Yao's next bit test is based on exactly this idea. And it's equivalent to, to another very important notion of randomness called Martin Luff randomness. But ultimately, that's all I wanted to do. Here's a little summary. Entropy, the measure of a number of arrangements with a probability distribution. Complexity is basically the shortest string that we need to reproduce some other string. And randomness is a string that doesn't have, that can't be squashed into an algorithm, OK? It can only just be reproduced. And that's as good as, as, good as you can do. If you're interested in this stuff and you want to keep reading, there is a handy 1,000-page book called Algorithmic Randomness and Complexity by Downey and Hirschfeld that I can thoroughly recommend. If it's not your thing, we'll leave it there, okay? You're now safe. So, if you didn't understand that, you probably shouldn't be talking about random numbers, if I'm honest with you. But this is the kind of stuff that's going on. Relatively sequential definitions, nothing that I think is particularly hard, maybe a little bit mind-bending at the start, but this is actually stuff that we can understand. So what are we doing? Well, I mentioned Arduino, and that's bad. Well, what's good? What does good look like? I claim this is what good looks like, OK? Who thinks this looks relatively uncomplicated? Good, I think it's very complicated. I think that's a good thing. This is the Linux random number generator. This is how you get random numbers out of slash dev slash random or slash dev slash u random if you're not fussy about blocking. OK? Notice it has a lovely little bit of stuff to measure the entropy. So we're now calculating entropy. OK? I feel like a weatherman doing this. We're now calculating entropy. And when it falls below a value, we're going to pull some out of the entropy pool that we've been managing with this little bit of circuitry here, which is going to then make sure that the probabilities are as unbiased as possible. OK? I won't bore you with why. I think you've had enough of that. But this is what good works at. Now remember, those five short lines of code took two days to fully cycle on an AVR compared to 26 seconds. That gives you an idea of the order of magnitude of lost power by moving from a laptop to a microcontroller. You're never going to get this, I claim, on an, uh, an Arduino. Well, you can, but you won't be able to do anything else with it, and it might get a little bit toasty. Okay. So what are we going to do? What can we do? Well, we can do this. We know the fundamental idea is take some entropy, pool it, do something with it to make sure it's there, and then seed a pseudo-random number generator that's a lot faster, usually, and use that as our random number source on a microcontroller. Now, do we have better candidates? Yes, we do. Pseudo-random number generators that are cryptographically secure are things like Salsa 20. That has some acceleration, if I remember. I've seen support for Cha-Cha 20, OK? Someone really likes their Latin American dances. Um, the Gimli permutation engine, uh, named because it's really short. That's used in libhydrogen. Uh, that was developed by Bernstein et al. And uh, that is optimized for use um, on uh, embedded systems. So we have better permutation engines for generating these numbers, but what we don't have is a thorough treatment of entropy sources. And there are four that are usually kind of fingered as being uh, very good for IoT. The first one is the watchdog timer jitter. 
uh, thermal noise from an uh, ADC, an analog digital converter, uh, RSSI noise, okay, so the noise that you can get out of a, a signal strength value, and a thermistor uh, jitter. There's always a little thermistor on a CPU in a, inside every microcontroller, and that is there for making sure that if the chip gets a little bit toasty, like I mentioned, it shuts off and saves itself. It doesn't set fire to the building, okay? So we can use these sources, but I couldn't find, when I was looking, and I did try, maybe I was looking in the wrong language or something, if someone knows something I don't, please do let me know, but I tried to find a thorough treatment of this, and I couldn't really find it. So I decided to say, right, well, what do we need? So we have these things, reference the top left. Here's what we need, I think. A simple test bed for assessing entropy sources, all right? If we can do that, then we can get a like-for-like -like comparison across lots of different sources, and we can do it between microcontrollers as well, okay? That, I think, is a useful activity. Some code uh, will get us reasonably good random number sources, and others will give us very bad, but we should be able to see that. I also want to look at things like speed, okay? Um, and memory is cheap, so I'm not too worried about size, but it tends to be small anyway. I'm worried about speed, okay? If you have to wait half an hour to get entropy, that's probably not practical, okay? Um, hence, you know, using a four-year-old with a big button isn't really going to work. Um, and I also want to measure like, how many components you need to add. What's the uh, expected cost, not just in code, but actually in the bill of materials, okay? How much is it going to cost you to implement this? So we set up some sort of test rig, entropy gathering, some sort of pooling, some processing. There are functions called extractors. And what these do is they do a little bit of what's called whitening. It just sort of uh, flattens out the probabilities a little bit such that you can get better entropy out. So um, an entropy source that you're reading might sink to zeros or to ones every now and again, and you don't want that. You want to do something to make sure that you've got a, a better likelihood of having a decent, what we call a fair random bit. And the output of this is going to be we can just plug these things into random number generators, and then we get proper random numbers, and for a set amount of time, then we reseed. OK? If everyone's with me so far, you can probably hopefully see that the outputs will be quite useful. We can say this is good, and this is bad, and here's why, because it did this in this test, and it did this thing, did this in this test, and this one doesn't have any components, but it's faster. This one's really slow and requires, you know, sort of a, a supercomputer. Um, we can make informed decisions and make informed assessments about what's going on. So this is what I came up with. This is code that is more or less lifted from POC or GTFO, uh, OX01. Uh, it's fully due to Dan Kaminsky, uh, gets full credit for all of this. Uh, he was looking at a clock jitter on JavaScript as a randomness source. And it was found that actually it isn't very it isn't reliably good. There's ve in Firefox, um, there were various phase locks where the clocks would get reset, and at that point, uh, you would kind of either be able to predict or would be able to guess reliably um, what the random numbers are going to be. But this is actually a very good test trick. So here's what you've got. You've got a, what we call the coin flip. So we're going to get a bit, OK? A zero or a one. Get magic is just something that's going to give us a byte, and I only care about the LSB. OK? I could also change it to only care about some bit in the middle, or the MSB, or whatever, okay? But it should be extensible enough that we can actually extract out what we want to test, that is. I want to get a fair bit. Now, this is interesting. This is called a von Neumann extractor. So we take A is a coin flip, and if A is not equal to another coin flip, we return A. That is, if we get 0, 0, or 1, 1, we ignore it. If we get 0, 1, we accept it, we turn 0. If we get 1, 0, we accept it, we return 1. And it might look like, well, what's the point in that? There's some nice work on uh, the permutate, on the extractor by von Neumann, uh, where it shows that it kind of, it tries to get as close as it can that the probability of 1 and probability of 0 is as close to 0 0.5 as possible by minimizing the bias, okay? And that's what we're, that's what we're after. And then the last bit is just to make a byte out of these coin flips, okay? So this is the kind of setup that I used. Very, very simple. It will install and compile on pretty much anything we want, and it gives us a reasonable sense of what's going on in an entropy source. 
So this is what I did. Okay, first thing, don't ask why this is soldered the wrong way around. That's a very long story. Um, likewise, you know, sort of, uh, don't ask where the paperclip came from. I don't remember, that's why. Um, but yeah, so here I'm just using a capacitor and a resistor. I'm charging this little circuit up on uh, a, a pin, a digital write of one to the pin. Then I'm reading it on A6, which is what that code is saying. And then I'm just passing this output into my basic, uh, Kaminsky basic generator. Now this gives you reasonably good random numbers and it's very slow compared to the others, okay? When I first did it, I was quite pleased. I was getting what looked like decent entropy. However, it was taking forever to run, all right? Um, so it's very slow. Now that could be because I was using you know, through-hole components. Maybe if I tried it again with surface mount components, that might be faster, because that's where you know, thermal properties are propagating less. Maybe that's involved, but ultimately I, I decided you can use it, but here's the real problem. You have to add traces to ground. You have to remove the use of at least one pin for reading, one ADC pin. And those are valuable. Those are gold when you're building a device. Um, and then you also have to you know, either power it in a controlled way or have something that will actually allow you to send a signal and then cut it off and all that other stuff. So overall, it does work. The people who are saying it works, they are right but I don't think this is the best option. Okay, so ADC jitter, mm, not that good. The next one was watchdog timer. So there is a, uh, a load of forums and indeed an Arduino library on uh, GitHub which will get entropy from the watchdog timer jitter. Okay, so as the watchdog timer runs, the clock will generate a lovely little bit of jitter for you and that is random. Okay, because jitter generally is a random thing. However, I found a problem. As you can see here, this was my fourth attempt at it, and this is the start of my second attempt at it. Okay, uh, so I've seeded a random number generator, the LCG in this case, and I've just fed it and pulled these numbers out. And in case you haven't seen it, they're exactly the same. This is on, this is on device reset, okay? This is the problem. When you reset the device, and it makes sense when you think about it, when you reset the device, the clock's reset. So the jitter you built up, the jitter, the lovely, wonderful, excellent jitter that you found, has disappeared, it's evaporated, okay? You've basically done away with it. Um, so I wouldn't recommend this because it's very, very easy to trigger a device reset. In fact, ironically, one of the ways of doing it is by invoking the watchdog timer, okay? But never mind, all right? But yeah, so this is actually, a lot is said about watchdog timer jitter. And when I first put this out on Twitter saying, I want some entropy sources from people, I got recommended this, I think, more than any other. And it does work, not the fastest, but it does work. But it takes about a second or two seconds, which in microcontroller times and epochs is an absolute eternity. If I remember rightly, uh, I think it's automotive that has a requirement of something like 400 milliseconds from like sort of power up to being ready to go. Like it, it, it's quick, okay? And you have to solve that problem. Now maybe you could take this one and the previous example and say, well, what if we store the entropy and then on reboot we recover it and do some permutation? And that's fine, you can do that, okay? That would work. And that's what's done on uh, other microcontroller systems. However, um, I found that the next two were significantly better. So I want to sort of have a look at those. So, thermistor noise. On an Arduino, you have eight pins for doing ADC, A0 through A7. There's actually a hidden pin inside that is the ADC for the thermistor and you can read it. This is the code to enable it. This is then passed into the basic Kaminsky generator, and I did my assessment. Um, the code will be available after the talk. So everyone, I want people to sort of go home and either tell me I'm wrong or tell me, oh my God, everything's broken. Um, but yeah, so you read the thermistor, and what I did was I take the LSB of that, okay? Because I'm looking at the tiny fluctuations in temperature, okay? The 0.1 or 0.2 degree changes because that is going to tell me um, 
It's going to give me better noise. It's not going to tell me what the temperature is. I don't care. But it's going to give me better noise source than um, looking at the most significant byte, which in most cases, again, will change, but very slowly as the device slowly warms up or cools down. So I took this and I ran it in, and it's quick. Okay? It really does work. It's got a big advantage as well. Every CPU, more or less, has a thermistor in it, although I'm yet to find one that doesn't. Okay? And in that sense, it's very easy to find the code to access that value, and then you can use that in your entropy pooling, and that's a good thing, and it's quick, and yes, if you breathe on it, the numbers come out faster, okay? That's usually a good sign. My neighbors already think I'm weird, so the sight of me breathing on microcontrollers in a window was probably not that unusual for them. But anyway, I digress. So this is actually, I think, a thing that we should use, okay? We should recommend this as one of our, one of our sources of entropy. Um, I didn't have any problems implementing this, but I did for the next one because I'm looking at RSSI noise. So, receive strength, a signal indicator, sorry, receive signal strength indicator, sorry, um, is common. It's in, a, in the IEEE standard. Every IEEE 802.11 uh, device has to have some sort of RSSI output, okay? So, again, if you have a radio, and that's the big if, if you have a radio, then you can ask it for the RSSI. For those of you who don't know, maybe uh, not fully afraid, you can have radio cores on a chip, actually built into the silicon, or you can actually get a core, which is what I did. I actually used an ESP32-based Hentec LoRa device. Sorry, LoRa WAN, I know. Um, but I used one of these devices, and I programmed it to give me the output through SPI. So this is now similar sort of code, but running on an ESP32 this time. Modular clock speed and modular a few other things. The code is comparable. Uh, it speaks SPI to the chip. It asks for the RSSI value by saying, read me the address, and the address translates to a register that is the RSSI value that the chip is updating all the time. And I pull that back using the lora.random function, and then I use the LSB of that. Why the LSB? Well, it's accurate to within point of a decibel, okay? So even in a very static context where your, um, your signal strength isn't going to vary, okay? It's not going to really change because your IoT device, unless it's on a train, and I know there are devices on trains, um, but unless it's on something like a train or a ship or something where the context changes, then it's going to be relatively static. But the LSB will change because the signal strength will move as someone walks past with Wi-Fi on their phone, or someone sort of uh, knocks it to the floor, will probably have an effect for various reasons, I don't know why. But yeah, you can see that actually, this is a very good source, it's very, very fast. Only if you keep asking it for RSSI values, some chips just fall over. They just go, nah, too much, mate, don't know. You know, um, and it doesn't return an error, it just stops responding, <laughs> you know. So that's not probably the best, uh, the best source. Um, but I think that if you took this particular example and the previous example, I think you'd actually have a very good kind of uh, metric and matrix of potential entropy sources. So this is an overview. Uh, Git, lab, GitHub, whatever link is going to follow. I'll decide on one or whatever, depending on what people are saying. And I've done some articles about this on Medium. And here's a link also to the NIST specifications on this. Yes, NIST have a specification for their entropy sources. And these are the results, OK? Hopefully, this is now kind of fairly obvious, OK? So I managed to split them into relatively fast and relatively slow, which was one of the metrics I had. If it's slow, for me, that's worse. If it's faster, for me, that's better. Also, I prefer not to have components, OK? I would prefer to have no impact on my bill of materials for a device, because that's the first question I get asked whenever I do security for an IoT company, right? What's the cost? And I have to give them a physical cost as well as all the development costs as well. If you have to add an HSM, that's expensive when you multiply it up by a million devices, OK? That's a big effect on the bottom line. Reading thermistor noise, that's fine. That's, that's built in anyway. Likewise, if you have a radio core, 
And if your radio core is either built in, or if it's not built in, then it is going to be kind of associated to the chip strongly, or it comes on a little ball, a little module, then you can ask that for information and then feed that into your random number generation. So I kind of color coded it to make it sort of obvious, mainly for me, because you know, I'm standing here giving a talk and didn't want to get it wrong. <laughs> but, but ultimately, this is the table of results so far. So far. I'd like to continue. So these are kind of more closing remarks. I didn't want to keep boring you with lots of mathematics. I'm a long-haired scout, so it's bad enough as it is. But what I wanted to do is just give you some kind of idea of what I want to do next. Okay, so the conclusions are fairly straightforward. The problem is not limited to AVR. Okay, this is a tweet from uh, Andrew Tierney at uh, Pentest Partners, where we found a device which, on factory reset, would generate a key. Within a thousand resets, there was a key collision. This is real. This is happening. That shouldn't be happening. Okay. We need microcontrollers to be compatible in a like-for-like -like manner. I would hope that this is moving some way towards that goal. We also need to look towards improving random number generation across the board. There are some very good random number generations. Um, I want to call out, for example, the ESP32 chips, the ESP IDF, Integrated Developer something or other. Um, their, basically, their SDK includes, by default, Libsodium. Yeah, Libsodium. And it also has, by default, a built-in HSM with native AES128 support in a chip that is marginally more expensive than the ESP8266, which is very, very popular. I actually challenged the guy. I said, well, what if I can get a key out off the HSM? And he said on Twitter, and I think it's on the website now, he said he put it there, tell you what, I'll give you $3,500 if you do it. Straight up. Putting your money where your mouth is, you know? That is, unfortunately, an exception to the rule. If I could have something tomorrow, if I could have my Christmas early, okay, what I would want is simple. I'm not expecting Atmel or Microchip, who own them, to change the silicon on a device. That is a big ask. I'm not asking for that. I'm not asking for things to change in the SDK, even. If I could have something tomorrow, I would just want a warning. I would like the words, not cryptographically secure to be in the documentation. Because if you read it, you would think it was secure. Unless you were thinking in a more adversarial manner, which of course every developer does, as we all know. That was a joke as well. Um, but anyway, so manufacturers need to be held to account to this. We need to start asking them questions. Why are you not doing this? Or why are you doing it in this way? And developers also need to be more aware. In security, we talk so much about the who and the what and the how, we very rarely talk about the when of security. If you have a long report with lots of things in it, if you're a consultant, hopefully you break it down and say, these things, these things first. These need doing by Tuesday, ideally. Okay? In fact, they need doing by last Tuesday, but we'll give you a week. And then, you, and then other things can wait. right? But that's, that's not necessarily all that common. I'm sure everyone in this room does it, but I've had situations where it isn't it isn't manageable because there's no when. When do I do security? When do I make these decisions? Okay? We need to be more honest about that kind of thing. With IoT, your cryptographic decisions need to be made when you choose the integrated circuit you're going to be developing for. Because cryptography is very hard to do backwards on a microcontroller. If your chip doesn't have native support for AES128, Adding it in, yeah, you can add the code, but you saw what five lines did, okay? How long that took compared to a laptop. You're just going to make it harder. AES was chosen, or Reindel Cipher was chosen, because it had good optimization in hardware, okay? So if you need cryptography, identify it early and then make your integrated circuit choice then, based off that decision amongst all the other things you're looking at. Because you can't do it backwards. You can't do it later on. It, well, you can, but that's expensive and very, very difficult. So future work, what else do I want to do? How do I want to take this kind of project forward? Well, 
I want to keep analyzing random number generators. I have one of these uh, infinite noise dongles, if anyone wants to have a look at it. That's a really nice design using operational amplifiers and uh, compressors and or audio circuitry, um, uh, analog circuitry, to generate random numbers into a USB dongle. I want to see if that's good enough. I want to look at other potential sources of randomness and noise that can be fed into um, either IoT. Like, if you really want really good entropy source, here's a really fast little circuit you can add and it adds this much to your bill of materials. But I also want to start saying, well, can we extend the test rig to include entropy estimation? An interesting point about the NIST set uh, setup, their specification is uh, doing things like the von Neumann extractor isn't required, but doing things like entropy estimation is. That is necessary. That's actually a required part. Okay? So if we are being honest with ourselves, we should also think, well, can we add some entropy estimation in? Is there a fast way of doing that? If anyone's got any ideas, do let me know. I'd love to hear. And then use this information, get, gather a body of information, put it in a public place, and then go, you know what? Here is what, is what you have. Here are the tools that seem to work. And then developers for things like LibHydrogen, another really good project that works, is kind of a lightweight version of LibSodium. Um, they've already spoken to me very briefly, but I've been really busy, so I haven't been able to talk to them. I will, honest. Um, but we can use this to inform our development of code, development of libraries, to make things a little bit less, well, crap. Okay? That's it. I hope it wasn't too much mathematics. Thank you very much for your time, eyes, ears, and patience. Thank you.